Hi, uh, AJ Hartley here. I'm a Shakespeare professor and a novelist and a baby metal fan. Um, and I've been doing this series of videos where I walk through some of these songs um, and talk about the things that I find fascinating or, or enjoyable about them. And people have been very nice and they've been watching them and commenting and sending me uh, suggestions and other uh, little snippets of info that I didn't have in some cases. So that's great. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad to see that um, my most recent video is back up in Japan, which is great because a, a lot of people there have been watching apparently, which is nice and uh, surprising. So um, I'm going to go straight into the song that I'm doing today, which is one that, to be honest, I didn't think I would get to, but I have been working my way through most of the first album and it just seemed like something I couldn't sidestep in all honesty it's just too important so here we go thanks i hope you enjoy it this is from the late show uh with stephen colbert recorded in april of 2016 and i really want you to see the sort of the very beginning and the very end if nothing else i'm not sure what i'm about to see <laughs> but i'm pretty excited about it here to perform Gimme Chocolate, please welcome Baby Metal. And before we go any further, you hear that crowd response. Now, this is their first, this is their, their US TV debut, the biggest, um, their first really big uh, exposure to a mainstream, not an internet, a mainstream TV market. And, uh, and in some ways, I don't think it's been topped since um but to get in the small studio here with a live u.s audience and to get that kind of response and colbert is a fascinating person to be introducing this and you hear that wariness in his voice he doesn't know exactly where to how to commit to this i think that's really telling you know it's funny, uh, uh, this is the first Baby Metal song that I saw. Uh, I probably saw it a little before this performance, about five years ago when the initial video first went viral. And, you know, it really did go viral. It has something like, I don't know, 120 million views on YouTube, which is just extraordinary. Um, but it was not a single originally. It was released um, as a kind of deliberate, gateway into the uh i've just realized that's mikio in the background there uh the i'm talking about the the guitarist who um who died early 2019 i guess after falling from an observation platform where he was stargazing really tragic and part of a fairly miserable year for the for the band and you know, what I was going to say is that even though this was the song that initially sp spiked my interest, as it spiked a lot of people's interest, it didn't actually get me into them as a band. I didn't sort of start poking around and exploring the rest of their stuff until quite a bit later. Um, it took a couple of years for me to start listening to other things. I, I think it required other things drifting into my uh, field of vision, as it were. Uh, but I loved this, and I remember sharing it on my Facebook page and getting all the kind of wildly different responses that this um, this always gets. And it went the, the wildly different responses that it got after this performance. I don't know if you've ever looked at some of the accounts of this particular performance, but you know, Twitter blew up afterwards. Some people absolutely loving it, and some people sort of raging. You know, threatening, I mean, demanding that the show fires it, whoever was coordinating its musical guests because it was so terrible. Just, I mean, sort of bizarre in, in their sort of failure to, to grasp it and failure to pick up what you can already tell is a, a genuinely excited and, and passionate audience response. Um, and, you know, of all the songs, when I'm just sort of listening to the music, especially if I'm walking around, walking my dog or whatever, this is probably the song I'm, I'm most likely to skip, if I was honest. And that's partly because I've heard it so many times and 
It's a light, fun song. There's not a lot of levels and complexity to it. Or so I thought until I started thinking about doing this little video. Um, so it's the one that I'm most likely to, to bypass. It's the one I, I don't tend to listen to all that much, though it is a song that they continue to play live because it is sort of their signature, along with Megitsune, which I already talked about. But I do find, going back to this video now and looking at it again for the first time in a long time, it has this sort of curiously... I don't know. I, I, it's really hard to pinpoint. And I said, you know, I said that it's fascinating to see Colbert being cagey about introducing them because cagey, because Colbert is the king of irony. I don't mean sarcasm. I don't mean that sort of crushing, <laughs> brutal, you know, lump hammer approach that somebody like John Oliver uses brilliantly. But, you know, uh, Colbert is, is, is wry. He's ironic. He's arch. Um, and baby metal aren't. And I think this is part of their appeal. And I've tried to say something about this before, and I didn't really, I don't think, did a, a very good job of it. Um, because I think that, you know, a lot of what characterizes American and British um, music and popular culture generally is that kind of arch uh, sort of distancing, wry sense of we're not taking this that seriously, which is injected into it. And we're holding back on our feelings. We're not sort of exposing ourselves. We're not being vulnerable. And I've talked about this before with regard to Akatsuki, which incidentally is currently available in Japan again, though how long that will last, I don't know, but I appealed it and it's up. Um, so yeah, I think that, that part of my response to this, and, and this is the opposite of Akatsuki in some ways, because Akatsuki is 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 dark and and moody and and emotional in a in a in a way that plays with with grief and longing and those kind of feelings. And this is the opposite. This is upbeat and joyous and playful and excited. Um, but the very rawness of that feeling is still sort of I find it curiously moving because it's so unlike the culture that we live in where people are constantly sort of distancing themselves and protecting their feelings by being sort of slightly snide you know and I'm, I'm not saying that in a critical way because a lot of that stuff I really like you know uh, I noticed the, the the new theme for the upcoming Bond movie came out James Bond movie um, and it's performed by Billie Eilish and I, I like Billie Eilish, uh, but it's amazing to listen to her sing a James Bond theme and it be so understated. And I'm not saying that there's no emotional um, content there. There clearly is, but it's all subtext. It's all buried beneath. We're seeing that sort of tip, tip of the iceberg and all the feeling is underneath. That sort of approach, uh, as opposed to a sort of Shirley Bassey type James Bond theme. And it's the exact... It's the exact opposite, because Eilish is from this very sort of self-deprecating, ironic, self-protective, understated sort of culture. And that's not this, right? And it's that openness. Look at that face, you know? And, and some of, of what we're seeing here is the sheer sort of performative brilliance, right? The, 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 a theatricality to this. But it's that sense of trying to present a true, albeit simple, emotional um, uh, vulnerability that I think really works. It looks like they're having such a great time, you know? It's still absolutely on point. Not a, not a step wrong. So Baby Metal obviously like to use little English words and phrases. This is common in, in Japanese music and culture generally, and has been certainly since, I want to say, the early 80s. Um, as part of a kind of that outward motion toward the, the, the West, um, the incorporation of little words and phrases, sometimes in ways that are frankly sort of meaningless. N not, not a, I'm not talking about baby metal, but generally. I when I lived there in the 80s, you would see English words tacked onto all kinds of things, and they were often hilariously inappropriate, you know, um, just sort of words picked at random to make it look sort of cool and 
uh, exotic in in a sort of vaguely uh, American or, or British sort of way. Um, and and you see this a lot in baby metal songs, but most of the time the words and phrases that you see are sort of very basic or the kind of things that you might hear in in songs. There's a lot of wows, a lot of come ons, a lot of hey, uh, let's go, counting. They do a lot of counting in English. Um, Doki Doki Morning has a number of, of English words and phrases like wake up and that kind of thing. So they're, they tend to be very simple and straightforward and usually sort of upbeat and positive because they're associated with a kind of foreign cool, right? Um, and, and as I said, I think, you know, th this is part of that impulse from the sort of post-war and particularly late 20th century move away from um, a sort of Japanese insularity towards what was frequently referred to as internationalization. And that goes hand in hand with the Japanese economic boom of the 80s, where they were, it seemed, constantly looking to the West for the markers of their own success, you know, to demonstrate that they had joined a, a global um culture and global economy and you know when when i was there certainly people were obsessed with american movies um but also you know slightly odd brands of post-war americana there were pool halls all over the place in the 80s um and frequently those pool halls would play the music of the 50s and early 60s um lots of early rock and roll even like Glenn Miller and big band stuff from from earlier um this sort of mark of uh Americana um of course there were McDonald's and such on every corner more so than there are now I think we've they've backed off from some of that form of internationalization but you know th this use of English words sort of peppered throughout anything that was supposed to be kind of cool popular culture uh, we still see in baby metal now, but as I say, most of those words are obvious choices. There's one that really stands out to me on this album, and it's in this song. Um, and uh, you know, in in the sort of the the main chorus, chocolate uh, chocho e kana demone chot demone chotto wait chotto saiken sinpai nandesu, and the word is the word is wait. Um, and it's not, uh, and the lyrics print it as an English word, not, it's not a katakana import. Um, and, and what the, the line is saying is, you know, I, 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 give me chocolate, but I've been worried about my weight lately. Right. And so the, um, the use of the term weight is specifically about body. And I was curious as, as to why they would use that word and not a Japanese equivalent. And so I was poking around and again, talking to the highest authority on these things, my Japanese mother-in-law. And, and she made the case that the notion of body image and specifically of, of slimness or thinness is a Western import. Um, and that until comparatively recently, and this is true of a lot of cultures, that plumpness was a sign of uh, affluence and was therefore uh, sort of folded into notions of female beauty. But that, that seems to have lasted much longer in Japan than in some other cultures. And it's really not until um, she suggested after the Tokyo Olympics uh, and then moving into that Japanese economic boom of the 80s where there's no longer any kind of food scarcity and slimness can become both a choice um, and something that makes you more like these foreign idols who were being imported, movie stars and musicians and so on, who were being allowed to drive notions of beauty in the same way that the pool halls and, and US rock music was uh, driving notions of what Japanese popular culture should be like. So b questions of body image were being increasingly informed by uh, ideas that were being imported from the West and that affect things like, for example, eye size and color. You know, I remember people talking about 
how beautiful a certain Japanese person was because their eyes were larger than normal, which I've always found sort of baffling, but it was because they were being held according to standards that did not naturally suit their own body type, right? So, in a sense then, um, when she's singing about being worried about her weight, it's the downside of this same internationalization, right? That as we move beyond um, Japan's own cultural uh, norms, some of the things that come along with that, um, including chocolate, which I'll get to in a second, um, work against your own sense of um, uh, healthiness, attractiveness, however you want to call it. In a sense, this this the sentiment of there being a downside to um, to internationalization it reminds me a little of uh, of of this little moment from uh, uh, David Bowie's encounter with another Asian culture. This is China, obviously. Yeah, that sense of the, the, whenever you get two cultures mixing together, there is a sense in which there's a certain colonial process that must necessarily play out to a certain extent, that somebody's going to be the dominant, and one of the ways that they're going to establish that is by flattening some of your own cultural traditions with their own. Great song. That that was recorded, incidentally, in 83, which was the same year that Bowie was... Uh, in uh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which was uh, a World War II film set in a Japanese prison camp, which is really worth seeing. Uh, Senjo no Merry Christmas is the Japanese title. Uh, and the theme music for that, incidentally, was done by um, Ruichi Sakamoto. And there, there was a, 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 a vocal version that was released by David Sylvian, the lead singer, of course, of... Um, the band Japan. So there's lots of inter interesting intersections. So the fact that he's Bowie singing about China, I think, doesn't mean that it, it's not relevant. It's um, uh, I think he's thinking about some of these same issues at the same time. But let's go back to our song. It's such a small set. Can you look how tight they are. Very proud. Yeah, and you know, the first time I saw it, I thought, "What's going on with the little pointy th stuff?" You know, I was like, "It's supposed to be gone." And, and there are images actually that remind me of those early James Bond sequences. You know, the sort of uh, girls with guns posing. Um, and now I think uh, that it's more simply about pointing to self and to Sue. And I'll talk about that in a second when I'm talking about chocolate itself. So. Chocolate is not a natural part of Japanese history or cuisine. The, uh, it didn't arrive in, in Japan in any form whatsoever until probably the late 17th century or thereabouts. And it wasn't manufactured in Japan until the 20th century. And even then, it was a kind of marginal commodity. It wasn't particularly well made by most assessments until considerably later in the century. And it was probably... The Second World War, the aftermath of the Second World War, and U.S. soldiers giving chocolate to children in Japan while they were sort of stationed there that was part of what raised the, the profile of chocolate. But it's not until quite a bit later that Japanese domestic chocolate production starts to really kick off. And again, it tends to, it, it's something that seems to get a real boost in the 80s during that same economic expansion that I was talking about before and internationalization. And fascinatingly, what we consider sort of high-end chocolate or craft chocolate doesn't actually start getting manufactured until 2014. And when I say craft chocolate, I mean where the entire process domestically, organically is being produced in Japan. And there are places in Tokyo which start to produce their own chocolate. 2014, which is the year before the release of Gimme Chocolate, or as it was called in Japan, Gimme Choco. Now, 
The other thing that's really um, striking, and I remember this from when I was living there, one of the, the single biggest event annually to push chocolate sales was Valentine's Day, February 14th. But <laughs> in Japan, Valentine's Day doesn't work the same way as it does in Western countries, right? Where in Western countries, people of both sexes give gifts to the person that they are most interested in or who are they're in a relationship with. That's not how it works in Japan. In Japan, only women give specifically chocolate on Valentine's Day, and they have to give it to all the men in their social sphere, particularly those for whom they want to show respect. A month later, on March 14th, in a, an event <laughs> managing to promote both the Hokkaido white chocolate industry and the patriarchy, the men then respond only to the women they like with gifts of white chocolate. And this has been sort of frequently pointed out as one of those sort of kind of trivial cultural markers of the sort of gender imbalance and the power implicit and the finances implicit in, uh, in an unequal gendered economy, right? Now, before you say this isn't relevant, let me just point out that the name of, the, uh, of that Valentine's Day chocolate that women are obligated to give to all the men they know is called obligation chocolate, or in Japanese, giri choco. Giri choco. Now, that's not a coincidence. The name of this song is Gimme Choco in Japanese. That's right. So what we're looking at here is a song about chocolate, not as something that goes away from me that I'm obligated to give to other people out of social nicety, but chocolate that comes to me. Ta -ta 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 me. Gimme choco. Am I saying that Gimme Chocolate is a feminist anthem? No, of course not. That would be silly. But kind of, yeah. So the, the initial verses are, are all about, I want some chocolate, but I'm worried about my weight, and please, 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 can I have it? But no, I shouldn't have it. And then... After we get the little instrumental break, we come back at the end and she's saying, I'm going to have some chocolate because it's really good and I like it and I want it and I've earned it and I'll continue to try hard and do good things, right? Um, so I have I deserve it. So I think it's that that's the balance finally between saying, you know, that there are these potentially negative things which are interestingly about not just navigating my own sense of self, but also in this sort of wider cultural perspective of navigating my international Japanese-ness, if that makes any kind of sense, of taking what the rest of the world has to offer and sorting through it and taking some of the good stuff, in this case the chocolate, and rejecting some of the negativity, in this case, uh, critique of uh, female bodies. That's what I think. There it is. Their album, Metal Resistance, is out now. Baby Metal, everybody. We'll be right back. So great. You know, consummate performers, having a great time. Perfect. Thanks for watching. As ever, like, subscribe, comment, and... Um, I'll see what I'm going to do next. Hopefully the videos will stay up. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Cheers for now.